When I was a kid in my neck of the woods, if you wanted to let someone know you'd call them on the telephone later, you'd say, I'll holler at you. Or if they wanted you to call them, they'd say, give me a holler. These phrases were a holdover from previous generations when they had been literal. In the mountains of Tennessee, people had communicated with each other by hollering. Hollering originates in the diaphragm, like operatic singing or yodeling, and can be heard for miles. Hollering is mostly extinct these days, except for a short period each year when the folks in Spivey's Corner, Tennessee, hold their annual hollering contest. You can check it out on YouTube. Hollering had been replaced by the telephone by the time I was born, though I used to enjoy watching my grandfather call his cows in for milking. He'd make a megaphone with his hands and give out a resounding holler that echoed through the hills. After a moment, here came the cows walking single file down the hill across the road and straight into the barn. Like most people, we had only one telephone in our house back then. It was one of the old black Bakelite models with a dial on the front and a separate corded receiver that sat in a cradle on top. Bakelite was the first synthetic plastic made from coal tar and wood alcohol. Bakelite phones were indestructible, but they were tethered to the wall so they were immobile, meaning there was no privacy to be had. Also, you didn't own your phone. You rented it from Bell Telephone. We were on a party line, so you were in competition with several other people whenever you wanted to make a call. Plus, others on the party line could listen in on your calls, so everybody knew everybody else's business. By the time I was in high school, several of the girls I knew had a princess phone in their room. None of the guys I knew had their own phone. There seemed to be some sort of unspoken agreement among parents that girls needed to communicate with each other more than boys did, and privately at that. This carried over into married life, at least at our house, where my mother spoke with at least one of her sisters every day and at length, but I literally never saw my father make a phone call. He received them on rare occasions, but that was it. While I was still in high school, our phone was moved from the living room to my parents' bedroom. The excuse given was so my mother could answer it quickly if it rang in the middle of the night. But it never did. After my brothers and I left home, a wall phone was added to the kitchen. Eventually, phones became cordless. You could take them to another room or even outside and still get reception, for a few feet anyway. CB radios were a huge fad for a hot minute. Mostly a blue-collar phenomenon, they mainly gave anonymous men the ability to sexually harass the few women reckless enough to venture into the CB realm, and for truckers to warn each other where the Smokies lurked. The CBers gave us a glimpse of the ill-mannered behavior that would later come to dominate the Internet. Ill-mannered was my mother's favorite expression of disdain for inappropriate behavior. It has a very good pedigree. Shakespeare also used it. Then came cell phones. They provided the mobility of CB radios with the advantage of privacy, but they were big and clunky and used mostly by business. After a while, they got smaller and we all got flip phones, which were very convenient, but were still mostly just phones. Then came smartphones, and we were finally an instant communication with almost everyone anywhere on the planet, and all the information in existence was at our fingertips. Some of it might even be accurate. The truth is, a smartphone won't make you smarter. Unless you're already well-educated and have a handle on critical thinking, a smartphone will actually make you dumber than you already are. In addition, getting a cell phone is like putting a neon sign on your roof that says, please come rob me. A huge percentage of the communications I receive on my phone are attempts to do just that. As I see it, the major problem with smartphones is while they make it easier to communicate, they make it even easier to miscommunicate. Because communication isn't just words. When we speak face to face, there's a lot of communication going on and the words are possibly the least of it. As we talk, in addition to what you're saying, I'm reading the thousand visual clues you're sending. This is mostly unconscious for the both of us. I'm watching your body language, your facial expressions, whether you're looking me in the eye or avoiding eye contact. Did you start speaking as soon as I stopped speaking, or did you interrupt me while I was trying to make a point? Both of those show you weren't really listening. You were taking the time while I was speaking to formulate your rebuttal. That's communication, too. 
email, texting, and posting, by their very nature, virtually guarantee miscommunication. The words we use are not very precise creatures, you see. The precise words exist, of course, but we don't use them, either because we can't spell them or it's too much trouble to type them out. We use shorter words and other elements, like contractions, acronyms, and emojis, which bring their own set of problems. I've twice answered a dead relative post with a laughing emoji instead of the huggy thingy. The sentence, what's up with you, can be read any number of different ways. Those words could be a friendly greeting, a request for details about your day, or they could be a testy request for an explanation of why you're being such a schmuck. There's no way to know based simply on the words. I suppose we could use Zoom or Skype all the time, but you know, the house is a mess. Maybe it's an age thing, but I know for a fact I can accomplish far more in a one-minute phone call than I can in ten minutes of back-and-forth texting. Even quicker, if I holler.